Hello, everyone, and welcome to Journey to the Center of Massive Data, featuring digital twins. This is brought to you by the SNEA Cloud Storage Technology Initiative. Today's con conversation is with Steve, who is with uh, who is a strategist and market analyst with uh, Intel. Hello, Howdy. Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. Awesome. Next, we have Praveen, who is a partner with IBM Consulting. How are you, Praveen? Hey, very well, Mike. How are you? Awesome. And I'm Michael Horde, your host and facilitator for today's discussion. I work for Intel, and I serve as chair for the SNEA Cloud Storage Technology Initiative. Let's advance the slide there. Before we get started, I want to I want to mention that SNEA, the Cloud Storage, excuse me, the Storage Network Industry Association, is a group of about 180 industry leading organizations comprising of 2,500 active contributing members and 50,000 participating IT end users and storage experts worldwide. As one of the organizations within SNEA, the Cloud Storage Technology Initiative is dedicated to education and promotion of cloud storage technologies like AI at the edge and digital twins, as well as driving understanding and collaboration among other industry associations. Before we get started, let's take a quick look at the SNEA legal notice. This provides SNEA's copyright notice regarding use of the material. There are no warranties expressed or implied. So if you want to reference this material, please do so at your own risk. You can download a copy of this presentation using the interface for this live webinar. The interface also allows you to submit questions during the talk and rate the presentation at the conclusion. We really appreciate your questions and feedback. For today's discussion, Steve and Praveen will address how applications like edge data analytics are driving digital twin usage to accelerate business intelligence outcomes. They will also provide examples how digital twins are being used today, tomorrow, and beyond in applications like adaptive agile factories and systems of systems processes. Then we'll have a uh, informal Q&A session, and we hope you will, uh, you in the audience will submit questions for, for our experts. If we're not able to cover all the questions during the session, we will answer your questions in a Q&A blog, which will be posted after the webinar. So let's get started. Steve, please take it away. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Pleased to be here. Um, I had a manager long ago who wouldn't allow me to ever present a proposal without describing a customer and his or her problem. So before we get into what is digital twins and how are they used, the, uh, I thought I'd start with the same case, uh, the business problems. Now, there are a variety of business problems for which digital twins are addressing. And these, this is a short list, but a pretty good list. It describes, you know, the problem of wanting or the desire to reduce defects, perhaps in a manufacturing environment or shipping environment, et cetera. The desire to go faster, but to do it safely, maybe in a factory, a warehouse, a shipping port, um, a mall, a transportation system, or perhaps a more complicated uh, challenge to reduce carbon, your carbon footprint, whether it's a building or a city or a, an entire enterprise, or even a very people-centric kind of challenge. How do I right-size an organization? Maybe my supply chain or my channel or HR or whatever. These are the kinds of problems for which uh, digital twins uh, are being applied today and in, in the future to address. Now, if these are the problems, don't we already have solutions to those problems? Don't we have data that help us solve those problems? Why would we need digital twins? So let's first start with the data question. Do we have data? Well, 
Yeah, we have data. In fact, part of the trend, you know, the trends that are going on in the marketplace in retail and healthcare and manufacturing and all kinds of different enterprises is there's this trend towards driving more and more software defined infrastructure. And that really kind of shows itself in you got physical things, sensors, machines, buildings, etc. And there are uh, the data that's being produced from those machines is either being consumed along along the control path, you know, by a, 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 a control application or a device manager, or a system management framework, or even, you know, those things running in the cloud or um, hosted in the cloud. We also have data that is, you know, traversing the, the data path, talking between machines, talking between the machines in the IT department and uh, gateways to get out of the building or to get to the cloud. We have data. There is a lot of data and it's actually growing rather rapidly. In fact, to give you a sense of that, a, uh, a, a, and I'm quoting IBM here, is, is just a typical large factory like an auto manufacturer will produce about a terabyte of data a day so data is not the problem or the lack thereof. What really is the problem is unlocking the value that is trapped within that data. And here we have this little graph. This comes from IDC and their global data sphere. And what this graph is really representing is, is that, you know, last year, IoT things, sensors, machines, cameras, et cetera, produced about six zettabytes of useful data. A zettabyte, just to kind of put that into perspective, is a thousand exabytes, which is a, a thousand petabytes, uh, which is a thousand terabytes. In other words, six zettabytes is a lot of data, but it's the kind of data that is growing really fast. In fact, it's one of the most IoT data is one of the fastest growing data types on the planet and is expected to hit 42 zettabytes out in 2026, according to IDC. But the real issue with data is not that we have enough of it. It's that there's a lot that is being analyzed, but there's even more that is presently not being analyzed. So for example, the dark purple in the bottom just basically says, out of those six zettabytes that were produced in 2021, about 45% of it was actually analyzed. Some compute system, some analytic system looked at that data and, and, and extracted some value from it. That meant that uh, over half of it was not analyzed, but if it were, it had a lot of trap value. Now, the, the good news is, is that the amount of unanalyzed data that should be analyzed is shrinking, but it still is growing so fast that it there is an awful lot of untrapped value. Now the untrapped value, we're gonna talk about that value because that's the value that helps us drive a, a factory floor or warehouse more safely. It helps us to, you know, predict, uh, you know, maintenance schedules for, you know, equipment. It helps us, you know, right size our organizations or reduce our carbon footprint. That trapped data is what we, what really needs to be unlocked for which Digital Twin has an important role to play. But wait, I mean, isn't that what AI does? Won't AI save us, in, you know, unlocking that trapped value? Well, Big tech and little tech is responding with the notion that AI belongs everywhere. And we'll just use an example to kind of illustrate a, 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 real, a, a real example that demonstrates how AI can be used to solve a quality problem. In this case, we have a robotic welder and a camera has been added to it. Maybe it's also a microphone to pick up audio cues as well as visual cues. That camera may be a smart camera or it may be a, a rather simplistic camera, but it's capturing images as the welds are being done. 
And those images are being interpreted by some kind of industrial PC or server that's running a, uh, an inference engine. Maybe it's based on something like an open project like OpenVINO. And it's not just the, the, the images that are being captured and analyzed in near real time, but also other control data. You know, how is that machine operating? What's the temperature in the environment? What's the, uh, you know, the, the, the um, voltage and the current levels of the machine? Are those contributing to, uh, you know, weld defects? And so your inference engine running on that, uh, you know, industrial PC can provide feedback to the, the controller of that robotic arm and corrective action can be taken. So in a way, this statement that big tech, you know, big tech like uh, Azure or AWS or little tech like the myriad of startup companies that are creating algorithms and AI frameworks, et cetera, are responding to the fact that there's an awful lot of data out there with trap value that can be unlocked. And the way to kind of look at it is, is, well, okay, we've got data in the cloud that needs to be modeled to feed the inference engines. We've got data, you know, that, uh, uh, that can be pushed or models that can be pushed out into the cameras, that can be pushed out into the controllers. Basically, there is the potential for AI to be everywhere to help improve in unlocking this trap value. So that begs the question, well, why do we need digital twins? So first of all, we need them because we're only human after all. And in, in an increasingly uh, pervasive way, we're, we are being more and more responsible for managing and operating very complex systems. And so what digital twins at the highest level of value extraction help us do is tame that complexity. And there's three ways that, it, you know, predominant ways that digital twins help tame the complexity of running a factory or a hospital suite or a retail store is one is digital twins acts as a honeypot of data. It kind of forces data to come to a common space and in a common format to be able to understand what's going on in that robotic arm or what's going on on that assembly line. A digital twin also uh, not only forces the, the data to be aggregated and in, and in some cases interpreted, but to visualize that data. And the visualization can be, you know, in many forms, visualizing the data about prior history with that machine or that thing, the present state, or even be predictive of the future state. And optionally, digital twins can be tied into the control plane of you know, the assembly line, an, an EV vehicle, and basically act as a way to normalize control or be a part of the control of establishing policies that drive those things like, how do I, you know, run a warehouse more safely, but quicker? How do I reduce my defects, et cetera? So in a way, digital twins really uh, are, exist because they help us humans tame very complex environments. Now, there's lots of definitions of a digital twin. This is just one. It came from Gartner. Uh, you know, basically says that it's a digital twin is a digital representation of a real world entity or system. They go on to make this other point that, you know, that real world system and the digital version of it are inseparably connected. They share data. That's one of the key issues between a digital twin and the physical twin is the sharing of data. It's that sharing of data, but between the, you know, going to the twin and from the twin back to the physical uh, thing that actually enables some of the magic of, of you know, data visualization and data integration that lead to better decisions and better visibility of, of how things are operating. Now, if we go back to our problem statement or some of the problems and we can overlay digital twins, what we find is, is that there are many different kinds of digital twins. And these are just, this is just four different kinds of digital twins 
that are specialized for solving particular business problems. There's a discrete twin, like we saw about how to improve weld quality of a robotic arm or a robotic welder, how to improve process quality or safety or efficiency. So there are process twins that are focused on, uh, on um, visualizing and controlling processes. There's organizational twins and there's composite twins. Composite twins are probably kind of the, the hardest type of twin, but yet could be the, some of the most powerful types of twins. Because what it really is, is it takes input from all kinds of different systems. Like let's say your problem is, is to reduce the carbon footprint of a office building. Well, to do that, you need input and control over all kinds of systems, the heating and air conditioning system, the elevator systems, the sprinkler systems, the entry systems, the motion detection, the lighting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a composite twin is a twin of, could be composed of a bunch of digital discrete twins. So what do digital twins do? Well, we, we've established already that, you know, first and foremost, they share information between the digital and the physical asset. That means they ingest data. In some cases, that data comes directly into the digital twin. In other cases, it passes through some form of AI functions like inference engines or training models, and therefore the data comes into the digital twin as interpreted. Other cases, it, it, it combines data that is uh, streaming data, you know, like a video is a streaming data or a heartbeat from a machine that says, I'm, you know, this is my temperature or whatnot. That can be streaming data, data and it can mix it with static data, data like when was this device or this asset built? Who, where is it physically located? Things like that, that it don't change. So, Digital twins, one of their first jobs is to ingest data. The other is to visualize that state. We talked about how we can visualize it, visualize it in past, present, and future states, but what can also be done in multiple ways. There is no one way that a digital twin is constructed or used as, you know, for visualizing that state. It could be a simple dashboard. One of my coworkers who works in the industry depart, industrial department says, never underestimate the value of a good dashboard. It could be something that is rendered into a real 3D image so that you could actually see it in a, either through a VR lens on a high screen. Um, <laughs> my motion detector just went off here in the, <laughs> in the office. <laughs> At uh, any rate, it, it, you can see it rendered, or it can even be immersive. If you've got VR glasses or AR glasses, be able to manipulate that digital image or that digital dashboard or that digital version of the machine or the jet engine, et cetera. So digital twins, my point is, is they can be, uh, they don't have to be just one way of, of, of visualizing the data. And I said earlier on that it, digital twins can optionally be in, inserted into the control loopback mechanism. This is where they become really powerful to automate uh, systems. And one of the values of, for example, having a, a, a composite digital twin, uh, like a twin of a shipping port, is, is that it talks to uh, a lot of the different elements in a shipping port, the cranes, the, you know, the uh, forklifts, the, the, the ships, the, and keeps an eye on wherever people are walking around or trucks are entering and exiting and the inventory of shipping containers, et cetera. And the value of having a digital twin is that it can normalize the way all of that is controlled because chances are, the, you know, the, the, a, a, a composite twin, let's say we'll just use a, a simpler twin in an assembly line, is that on that assembly line, there are people, there are machines, there are sensors, and they come from different vendors. And being able to establish a control policy to say, hey, you know, somebody's put their hand in the wrong spot, stop the, 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 the assembly line so no one gets hurt. 
and, and be able to talk to a bunch of different machines all at once in order to affect that safety mechanism. That's when, when you put digital twins in the control loop, then things become uh, much more powerful and much more automated. So let's look at that, um, how digital twins, uh, you know, are actually built and deployed. So in a way you can think about that digital twin is being connected to the physical twins, which means it goes through the network. It means it could be interfacing with the legacy controller device management apps or the, the more, you know, the legacy system management applications or if that data and some of the uh, is in the cloud, being able to ingest data from the cloud to mix it with the data coming from the machines and on and on and on. The, a, a, a digital twin can be become a um, integral part of the control loop and the data path. And part of the way that this gets actually easier to understand is to look at the way certain companies are actually delivering or packaging digital twins with their physical products. One way to do that is, is to create a digital twin um, framework or feature set and deliver it with your device managers or your system management software. So as a software upgrade, this is the way some of the companies like Siemens does it. They, have, uh, they extend their, their control software with digital twins. Another way to do it is to uh, bundle it as kind of like an appliance, meaning put it in with a gateway so that you can just plug it into the network and start operating digital twins of the things that are connected to a local area network. Or digital twins are offered as a service, a part of an edge service and operate on an edge cluster. And for digital twins that can tolerate more latency, like, you know, organizational twins where humans are involved in the, or humans are involved in the decision process where latency isn't as, can, as restringent, your digital twinning technology can all exist in the cloud. And in many cases, that could, means that if it exists in the cloud, it can be delivered as a service, it can be delivered as a subscription, it can be delivered as just a package hosted in the cloud, but owned by an enterprise. So digital twins are a very flexible capability that there is no single way for them to be deployed and no single way or single definition of what they can do. So with that, I'm gonna hand off to Praveen, who's gonna talk about some actual ways of, of you know, his, his experience with implementing digital twins and things to consider. So take it away, Praveen. Thanks, Steve. That is really insightful, right? And, uh, and, and one of the things Steve talked about is this kind of evolution, if you'd like, of technology. So, so if, you, if you think more broadly, right, digital operations is, is really a journey. And, and digital twins, you could argue, right, where do they sit on this, on this curve? Right. If you think about um, I mean, a simpler way of thinking about this is a model where people talk about digital models, which are digital representations of physical entities. So Google Earth is probably a good example of that. Right. It's a physical it's a digital representation of a physical entity. Right. If you take one step forward, you have digital shadows where there's data coming one way right, from the physical entity. Uh, to the digital world, right? And if you think about it, a simpler example could be tracking your pizza guy, right, on your app, right? And then finally, there's that element of that digital twin, where there's that control mechanism going back and forth. So the data data flow is two ways rather than just one way, right? So, and, and as we've seen the cost of innovation, right, and, and more accessibility to technology, right, whether it is computation technology, whether it's storage technology, or whether it's networking technology. But as we've seen accessibility to that um, improve and cost reduce, right, we've seen value that we can derive from all of these significantly higher, right? So you could argue that digital twins today, as they've been talked about, probably sit in this, probably sit in this space, right, where you have the control tower, which is the mechanism that Steve talked about visualizing states, right? So through a control tower-like mechanism, 
right? And thinking about that simulation and optimization, right, through a control room-like mechanism, right? And then as we go further, right, you can see twins of twins, right? And and that level of autonomy that Steve also kind of spoke about, right? Where where if a autonomous ship goes into an autonomous port, they can have a handshake and figure out what is the best way to dock that. And you can see that in in what are being called dark factories, right? With minimal intervention, if not zero intervention of, of humans, right? To be able to take a lot of these, what would what we would refer to as dull, right? Or, or dangerous, right? Tasks, right? Uh, and take the human out of the loop and set the human on the loop, right? Uh, so it's really an evolution. Right? There are loads of examples in which we've been using this. So see, Steve spoke about different ways in which you can visualize this, right? So we've been working with manufacturing companies where they can, where they can use augmented reality headsets, right? To look at assembly, which is overlaid, right? And repair that is overlaid so that you can walk young apprentices through the process, help them train quicker, right? Saving significant chunks of money, right? So with one of the organizations we've been talking to, we've been talking about a 10X return, right? In three years with 2X being in the very first year, right? And they're looking to save their training costs by 20%. Right. Uh, we've been talking about how can you bring a younger workforce, right? Um, the workforce and, and skill set is a real challenge today. Right? But how can you bring a younger workforce into a more immersive environment? Again, something that Steve alluded to, right? And in this particular case, this is an energy and utilities company that you can see, right? Where we've simulated a, uh, not, not simulated, we've been creating a digital twin of, of a substation as a critical collection of assets right on the network and the in, in for three reasons right we've created the twin twin for three reasons one is how can i how can i remotely monitor in a real time kind of immersive environment how can i remotely monitor the state of the asset how can i then use this immersive experience to simulate right thereby reducing my capex cost so i can simulate it in the virtual world Right, I can run it through different simulations, see what is the optimal scenario, right, and then run it in the physical world, right, and then take that feedback and learning from that physical world, almost creating kind of an infinite loop, right. So you optimize in the digital digital world, right. You go and try it out in the real world, right, and then go back with your learnings to optimize your um, your predictions even further. And finally, for training, right. Um, uh, then again, we've we've used uh, like Steve alluded to dashboards, right? Uh, and and yes, you cannot waste a good dashboard. Uh, again, in energy and utilities, we've been using it to to advise humans, right? Grid operators to be able to tell them what is the next best action. How do you how do you route energy from point A to point B, right? Based on not just supply and demand of uh, of, of electricity or power, right? But also the underpinning assets that underpin that network, thereby extending the life of your asset and thereby reducing your operating costs, right? We've used it in, in manufacturing so that we can, we can look at machine downtime at any point in time. And again, advise the operator on how to switch a line, right? Uh, if we anticipate machine downtime, again, thereby improving asset life, right? Introducing through predictive maintenance, right? Uh, and also do some condition-based monitoring, again, with the view of reducing OPEX in manufacturing, right? So we've got loads of such examples, right? In in, um, in in gas transmission, right, which you see on the bottom left, right, we've been talking about how do you streamline operations. So one of the challenges we've seen is the single view of the asset, right, across multiple, across the life cycle, right? So going from going from engineering and construction through to operations, through to maintenance, do all your all your stakeholders, internal and external, including your contractors, have a single view of the asset, right? Uh, in, in an engineering project, how can you combine? How can you? How can you at any point in time look at what was, what was designed versus what is built, right? Um, so to understand the state, right, uh, of of progress, if you'd like. Um, so there've been multiple particular areas, and of course, um, sustainability and energy is very very topical, right? Uh, especially in Europe, given the energy crisis that a lot of countries are going through and how do how do how do energy hungry organizations energy intensive organizations optimize right their energy utilization and hence optimize their operations 
uh, thereby keeping their costs low and giving something back to the market. Right? We've seen a lot of uptake of digital twins in infrastructure projects, right? So civil infrastructure, roads, bridges, inspecting the roads and bridges, again, looking at some of those uh, dull, dirty, or dangerous jobs, right? And getting drones to fly, right? In dangerous situations where we don't need tower climbers or bridge climbers climbing bridges to inspect, but then also using using machine learning models to predict, right? Uh, what what to identify defect detection, right? So that you can predict right before the worst case happens, right? And thereby then sending the human to go and do some inspections, right? And confirm. Right, whether this particular image that I took in this particular cement structure, right, is that uh, is that a crack, right, or is that just dust that the <coughs> that the camera could not pick up, right? So it's how do you and how do you enable the human? How do you make somebody's life better, right, as a result of doing these things, right? So starting with the human in mind, kind of three lessons that we've learned through a series of client engagements, right. First is avoiding what we call the proof of concept purgatory, right. So one, anything between one to thirty, one in thirty to one in sixty pilots or proof of concepts, go on to transform your business, right? So really think, and and, and this is what our clients have figured out is to really prioritize them pretty hard, right? And and identify if if the POC or the pilot that I'm embarking on, right, is not just for the sake of innovation, but contributes to their their strategy for lack of a better word right and and uh, and has that linkage between what they're doing at any point in time through that process they've also realized that data is is always a challenging question right steve talked about the amount of data that is generated and how much data there is to unlock value but data can be very very overwhelming right so where do we start right and and while a lot of projects think about data first Right, data right is one of the lessons that we've learned working with our clients, which is you know where you want to go from your strategy, you know what business outcomes you want to change, where do you want to move, where do you need to move the needle, what are the use cases that contribute to that business outcome, and hence what is the data that is needed for those use cases. Right, so focusing on the right data and always, right, and, and the third thing that we've learned through that particular process is always focusing on scale. Right, whether it is economies of scale or whether it's economies of scope, right, that they they would consider right, as they look at scaling. So this this is one of the areas where we've le where we've learned from clients significantly. The second thing that we've learned is while you want to kind of make sure that you scale quickly, starting small, right, um, um, proving value time and again, right, and and start getting started in days rather than weeks and months. Right, so that we can, with the aim of delivering value as quickly as possible. Now, here's an example of one of the ways in which we've run these with our clients. Right, I'm sure you have your own methodology. This is based on design thinking principles. Right, but again, think about how do you start small, deliver value constantly, and scale quickly? Because that is what we've seen successful organizations do working with clients. Uh, this is an example of starting small again, right? Is if, if you want to build a a set of high fidelity prototypes to go and not just bring bring a few pictures to your vision and add more color to it, but also to test it with the users who are actually going to use to increase adoption, right? Of these of these transformation transformative transformative engagements. Right, day one we do some we do an exercise around identifying pain points for the users that are actually going to be impacted right as a result of this transformation engagement day two is you start to do some sketches and some low fidelity prototyping and day three you do some high fidelity prototyping so now along with your business case right at the end of a week of investment right you can have a high level business case you can identify what data do you need what kind of use cases there are but also bring it to life with a few images right of what your end solution could potentially look like right? and who are those sponsored users around whom you're going to rally uh, as your chain champions, right? And finally, right, talking about people, it, right, we, everything that we've realized working through organizations is that ultimately any transformation needs a cultural shift, right? It is about, and, and this is the, as trite as it sounds, it's about holding people's hand through that process, learning by doing, right? Uh, and in the skills war that we spoke about earlier, right, how do we introduce these new ways of working? I was recently with a manufacturer and they said, how do I, how do I how do I implement this change not just at the top floor but also at the shop floor, right? To be able to educate people at both ends of that of that chain of command, right? On on what are the new ways of working, 
and and finally uh, again as strat as it sounds right is is looking to break down those silos that exist right one of those mechanisms that we spoke about was engineering operations maintenance right could be three different businesses doing three different things how do they have that single view of that asset and and create a digital thread so to speak right across that entire value chain that they run and 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 that brings us to q and a with about 20 odd minutes left so hopefully that's been insightful for you guys and uh, something that you've taken away from that uh, michael anything in terms of uh, concluding yeah. where we open it up yeah that's fantastic thank you both for uh, that excellent uh, information and we'd like to open up uh, questions uh, and welcome the audience to uh, send in some questions and um, and uh, please let us know uh, where we should focus and how we can add more uh, more clarity. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what is the difference between a digital model, a digital shadow, and a digital twin? Right. So, um, so in 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 one of the ways of of measuring, right, uh, progress or capability maturity, right, is this concept of the digital model the digital shadow and the digital twin right i kind of alluded to that early on which way we spoke about the digital shadow being a digital representation of a physical entity and the two the two things are not connected in any ways right uh, which is the digital model right google earth is probably a, a decent example of that right and the digital shadow is where we take the physical entity and send data one way from the physical entity to the digital entity so that the digital entity is updated uh, in real time or near real time, right? So tracking your pizza uh, as an example, right? And then finally, there's the digital twin where it's bi-directional, right? And again, there are, there are many definitions like, like Steve kind of called out at the, at the very beginning, but this is one of those maturity models where the digital twin is data sent bi-directionally. So the physical physical twin can send data to the to the physical twin, right? Or the virtual twin. And the virtual twin sends back a control mechanism Right, a great example could be unlocking features in your car as it stands today. Right, uh, most of the cars that are connected today, right, have one feature or many that you can unlock. Right, so it's command send, commands being sent back to your car, right, to unlock new features in your car. Great, Steve. Steve I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, no, that's a good good answer. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we've got a question from the audience. Um, what if we trust the twin too much and do we run into a higher risk when uh, the model and reality do not align well? Yeah. I'll, I'll take the trust one first and maybe Praveen, you can, <laughs> you can have the tougher one, the model question. Um, uh, trust, I mean, Clearly, one of the obstacles or, or brake pedals to the adoption of digital twinning will be the level of trust and, between the digital twin and the physical twin. Being able to share data and uh, attest to its origin from either direction is critically important. The good news is it doesn't have to be symmetrical. In other words, you can use your digital twin to enhance some of the security capabilities of the physical twin and also to lock down the physical twin. So one of the biggest threats to critical infrastructure would, for example, would be if a, a, a you know, unauthorized uh, actor were able to hack into, you know, some pump or uh, sensor or, actuator and change the configuration. Um, in most cases, many, you know, physical connected things do have the ability to create an encrypted connection to something else. Usually that something else is a control application. If that control con connection was put to the digital twin and the digital twin was decidedly uh, by the administration, that that's the only path to which control data can actually travel to the physical thing is to go through the digital thing. Then you could add all kinds of authentication and attestation capabilities in the digital twin world. But it is absolutely essential that you know trust be established between the digital thing and the and the and the physical thing. 
It's also essential that the data transfer be secured so that it can't be tampered with. And the, the identity of both ends of that equation, the physical and the, the digital twin, be uh, attested. And that's those are kind of some of the qualities that will make when you go and you select, you know, a digital twin framework or a solution from a, a, a vendor or build one in-house. Those will be some of the criteria you necessary to use to judge the value of, uh, you know, a selection. Yeah, uh, and and just to kind of build on that, right? Assuming the 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 transmission is is secure, right, and uh, it's not being tampered with, right? To your question about uh, can you trust the twin too much? Right. I, I'm trying to try give, give you another example on this. Um, so we've been working with uh, tower companies, telecom tower companies specifically, right? And um, they don't run. So, so the way they create a digital representation of the physical tower is to is to run it through drones because this, you don't have CAD models that you can ingest to create that digital model of the physical tower, right? So you run a drone based on photogrammetry. You reconstruct the the digital entity or the digital twin of the tower right or the digital model of the tower to be even more specific right but then to keep that tower up to date to know where which equipment is placed where right they run they choose to run right a, a drone flight every month um, until and unless it is triggered by another event which is somebody else has gone up for inspection or hanging new equipment then it then by by regulation you need to reconstruct the drone reconstruct the tower but they choose if if no change is made to the state they choose to run it right on a monthly basis right so the frequency really depends on the on the use cases and the appetite of the organization uh, and and somebody else somebody else has asked that question saying how old is the data at any point in time right so at this point right i mean think about status quo before the digital twin what you have is at best you have some drawings on a piece of paper Right, that was constructed when the drone was when the when the tower was going up at the very first time, and since then there have been practically no updates to that piece of paper. Right now, people who are sitting and two sets of users who are sitting and looking at these. Right, one are engineers, which is if I am a a provider of 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 towers. Right, I can have I can use that to collaborate with multiple parties. I can use that digital twin of the tower, even if it is a month old at best to talk about where can equipment be placed with other designers right? but i can also use that if i'm selling space on the tower right even if my even if my even if my draw, even if my digital model is is a month old but going back to the question of trust i trust it because there is an audit mechanism i can go back look at pictures of the flight path right i need i need over 1400 rough rough orders of magnitude about 1000 to 1500 pictures to reconstruct the tower i have the audit capability to go back to the images and actually look at the images, right, to be able to trust what has been reconstructed at any point in time. So, so hopefully that answers the question about trust and the question about kind of how dated would the data be at any point in time. Yeah, yeah that's excellent. Um, another question, isn't Google Maps also an example of a digital twin, especially when we're using that for our driving and getting from place to place? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Google Earth versus Google Maps. I think in my mind, that is the distinction, right? Google Earth, I think, is a model that is shot at a particular point in time, right? And parts of it is updated at any point in time. So it's a digital, in in in, in that kind of very simple spectrum, a digital model. But yeah, I think Google Maps is a great example, right? I mean, the only catch there is that, right? Uh, if if you're if you're thinking about one of those ways, right, in which is data being sent back. Right, and is there a two-way mechanism? Right, it's probably not a two-way communication. Right, so the map doesn't move my car, right, or move any other cars to optimize the traffic on the road. Right, if Google did that as a part of an agreement, that would be a scary, but b then I think it would be a real, <laughs> real digital twin. Right, in, in that particular definition, right. But again, there are so many definitions out there. But that's that's one way of thinking about it. Right, is that it's absolutely a a digital representation and a real-time digital representation. Right, um, but but there's no two-way communication between the digital and the physical. But Praveen, just rifting off of what you just said there, in a factory environment or a warehouse environment, where you have shelves that are moving, you know, or robots that are delivering assets, or uh, 
you actually can take that next step of optimizing the path of the vehicles that are moving through in a, a space to produce higher, you know, result in greater security and greater throughput. Absolutely, automation is very important, right? Um, there's a there's a very exciting project called the Mayflower, right? So for those of you who haven't seen, right, please check it out. This, this is this is the autonomous ship to mark the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower, uh, the original Mayflower going from Plymouth in the UK to Plymouth, Massachusetts, right? And it's a completely autonomous vehicle, right? And that's a beautiful representation of a digital twin because it's got six cameras on board. It judges the path, and at any point in time or a Roomba in your house, right, is also a great ex example of a digital twin, right, because it kind of self-regulates and automates itself, right, and moves itself. And it does that because it has a, a digital model that can do all that processing on the edge, right, and reconfigure itself and move itself, right, through your house. Great. And uh, another question, uh, can you expand on the example of data ingestion at uh, the edge and... Um, with reference to data centers and actual edge uh, data capture. And then uh, what use cases might uh, make benefit of that uh, the most? Well, a good example I can think of is uh, um, surveillance. You know, most surveillance that occurs today is basically either uh, low-tech cameras or smart cameras that feed data to some, you know, network video recorder, some NVR. And that NVR will likely have some, uh, you know, AI or analytics capability to determine, you know, is there a threat or is it a dog or a cat or is it a person, you know, is there some abandoned piece of luggage or something like that. But increasingly as, you know, cities uh, and larger spaces become uh, more surveilled, then moving um, that NVR function, that analytic function, to a, a more central location, like an edge compute cluster that maybe that is in a central office of a comm service provider, or a colo location like at an Equinix data center down the down the street, um, or, or you know the the an enterprise data center if it's if it uh, that's owned by the city. Once you get multiple enough multiple da data streams coming into a central location, then you can begin to do create more real time maps of what's going on, uh, whether it's for traffic purposes you're doing it or safety purposes or security purposes, and the 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 value of getting that data into a uh, location is is that let's say you want to actually create a digital twin of your city transportation system, you can use that information to help guide, um, you know, citizens to places where you can park. I mean, something as mundane or as boring as that. And that's a much more live, interactive uh, capability where, you know, the, the data of analyzing and surveilling a city is actually being used by the city to help its citizens you know, it, uh, unlock value of not wasting time driving around blocks looking for a place to park on the street. Just, just one other example to kind of build on that, right, is uh, to the question was around kind of data ingestion at the edge, right, um, and, and processing and, and, and how much of it is stored on the, or, or how much of it is sent right for storage versus discarded, right? And, and in my, my experience kind of um, I'll, I'll talk about the use case and then talk about the generalization of the use case. Uh, we've been working with uh, insurance companies, uh, and insurance companies are sampling data on black boxes or through a connected car, right, at a very high frequency, right? They they sample it at a very high frequency for for two sets of uh, use cases. One is to understand how a driver drives, right, or driver to to create a driver behavior score, right, and second is to reconstruct an accident so that they they can know, right, who's at fault and how do you pay out. Right, based on that accident. So if you choose to share your data clearly with your insurer, right, those are the two sets of use cases that they look at. So the, the black box on the car samples, the sampling frequency is one hertz. So effectively you have right, a set of data points every second that's measured. Uh, and then there's another, and, and th this is getting too technical, my apologies, right? There's, there's, an, there's, an o, there's, a, there's a buffer, right, which measures, right, 
100 data points per second, right? And it, the buffer lasts for eight seconds, right? So in this particular case, the insight that the insurer is interested in is every, in uh, the insurer that we've been working with is interested in is give me a, give me a snapshot of how you're driving, right? Every two kilometers or every 10 minutes, whichever comes first, right? So that I know what is your waypoint, I know how you're accelerating, right? And then I can broadly gauge how you're cornering, how you're braking, et cetera, right? But what they're more interested in is at the event of a crash. So in the event of a crash, that buffer, which stores seven to eight seconds of data, so that's 700 to 800 data points, is then sent in the event of the accident, that buffer is locked, and then that data is sent, right? for storage in the cloud. But otherwise, the data that is sampled on the edge is sent every two kilometers or every 10, 10 minutes because that is the data they're interested in sending out. Again, the use case right, drives how, how, how much I sample right, and how much I store versus how much I transmit. Right? And it's also clearly, it's, 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 the other consideration is cost. Right? What is the transmission cost? What is the storage cost as a result of that? So, so the generalization is that where there is high sampling, right, and high network costs and high storage costs associated, right, is where I think edge plays a role apart from security itself. We've been working with, uh, with, with a government, right, and they want to make sure that all the images that are being captured by drones in secure facilities, none of that is sent to the cloud, right? It is all processed on the edge, right? The analytics are served at the edge, and for images that are that are critical, right? They're stored locally, right? On a local network rather than being sent to the cloud, right? So I think there are a number of different ways in which you think about it. Uh, but going back to the question on top about regulatory and compliance, right? We're seeing, I think it depends on jurisdictions as well, right? Even within Europe, uh, as an example, in the, in, in the courts in Italy, right? Um, data from a black box is accepted as evidence, right? Whereas that's not accepted Right, in a lot of the other jurisdictions, as an example. Right? Um, also, the regulators are driving some of this conversation. So in the UK, the energy regulators invited a whole bunch of bids for people to generate digital twins in the energy infrastructure business right, to contribute to the entire industry. Right? So the regulator is driving a lot of this conversation. Right? So I don't think there's a simple answer around regulatory, regulation and compliance, but from my experience on regulation and compliance, the amount of data that we can capture and the amount of insights, auditable insights that we can provide, right, um, stand the stand the companies in a regulated environment a a far greater chance, right, of of having a dialogue with the regulator than companies that are not adopting these sets of uh, capabilities. Great, yeah, we have a question on uh, regulatory compliance and. Uh, you can see it's a longer question, but uh, um, the main uh, gist of it is uh, how how do the digital twins uh, fit into compliance and regulatory? Um, how is that done, or uh, any any insight into how that, <coughs> those dynamics play? Yeah, so like I just mentioned, Michael, I think it's a bit of a conversation with the regulator, but the regulator is in a lot of geographies. I've seen the regulators come up and have this conversation and, 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 and are actively encouraging the use of digital twins, right? Um, and, and actively encouraging participation in the industry, right? Also setting standards. I think standards is a, is a huge part of it, right? But most organizations I've worked with, right, in the regulatory and compliance space, right, find digital twins empowering the conversation with the regulator significantly more because we capture a lot more information, right? We analyze a lot more information than they would have without a digital twin, right? So having the digital twin is, is I mean, gives them a shot in the arm, right? To, to have a better dialogue with the regulator about how they're complying. And I would just add one example, the, the, you know, in many cases, the desire for having a much more flexible, let's say, whether it's a retail store where you're moving shelves around, point of sale terminals, digital signage, stuff like that, to have the flexibility to move move things around in an easy way and then track the way people move through it. Or let's say a, a factory or some kind of manufacturer who's, you know, wants to reconfigure their assembly line 
each one of those reconfigurations represents a safety risk issue that needs to be analyzed. And in some cases, in some geographies, that those risks are um, expected to adhere to certain compliance levels and certifications from, uh, you know, compliance organizations within like the EU or North America, et cetera. And some of those, com I, I, I've had been having conversations with, you know, some of these uh, regulatory uh, bodies and what they're looking at digital twins as is ability to actually do real-time compliance uh, uh, attestation. So if you can, uh, you know, kind of a two-step process, if you have a digital twin of your assembly line and you can represent that to your regulator, then the regulator can, you know, see how the machines are working and interacting with each other for the safety of the workers. And then if you reconfigure it, you can show in a simulated case that that it, the safety is, is maintained. And then as in that simulated environment using you know digital twins as your conduit you can reapply those new co configuration to the physical world and then verify with actual mere data that it indeed matches the safety uh, profile that was in the simulated environment so in some ways the compliance officers are seeing digital twins as a way to do their job more dynamically and more easily and more accurately without as much disruption in the long time it takes to certify you know a configuration of a machine yeah absolutely and, and just to build on that right i mean we've seen that even with civil infrastructure right whether it's roads bridges viaducts right? It is the data and the insights that a drone would give you as an example, right? That goes back to the dashboard of a physical inspector, right? Of a civil inspector, right? Who's going and looking at that and saying, yes, you know what? I mean, you've given me the insight that I did not know you. We're now being proactive and prompting inspectors to go to a particular site and look at a particular defect, right? In a very, very marked out area, right? So it is there to to give them more superpowers, right? That they would not have had otherwise. Great. Hey, we have uh, just a, a minute, a couple minutes here. Last question. Uh, what are some of the leading digital twin development frameworks for hardware and device manufacturers to impl implement and package digital twins into their product? Well, the one I know of, and, and I, I I know it's not the only one, but um, Siemens bought Mentor Graphics five years ago and added, you know, the visualization of data to their physical uh, product offerings. And so I know that they offer a pretty comprehensive solution. How well it does with, you know, third party uh, uh, machines and sensors and data, I can't say. But I've seen the with their own, it's pretty impressive what they can do. Yeah, and, and this is probably one to go back to the to the Q and A post as well, right? Uh, I think it's a great question for us to be able to kind of articulate a few more. That right? would be really use, useful. I realize we've got two minutes left and probably yeah. a little bit of time for feedback. Yeah, and um, yeah, we could possibly uh, address more of the standards. Uh, I know there's a, a little bit of standardization going on in the industry 4.0 area, but. Uh, yeah, I think that concludes our Q&A. And uh, just want to thank you both for your uh, tremendous insight, information, and uh, appreciate all your time and effort uh, that, that went into this. So thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you to our audience. Uh, thanks for joining us. And please remember to rate this uh, webinar as this is very important to get your feedback. And this helps us to create better educational material. Um, also, please remember, you can always download this presentation and many other items at our educational library, as well as follow us on Twitter. Thanks again uh, to everyone for, for uh, joining and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.